once said he wrote 74 operas. And in the time when there's no internet and television, the reason these pieces got done is because they were truly dramatic. And how much you like Don Pasquale or Elysée, they're great fun, but essentially they're glasses of champagne. Personally, I prefer something a little more uh, substantial for my entree. And the three TV operas that Don and Seti wrote, Maria Stuada, Roberto Devereaux, and Anna Bellina, are extraordinary complex pieces. And the more you come to the performance with just a little bit of history, the much more you'll enjoy it. In that we are dealing not with the young Queen Elizabeth, but the Elizabeth I at the end of her reign. Just a little bit of history. Her father, Henry VIII, had died, and initially his one son, the son he finally was able to produce out of these six marriages, came to the throne, <laughs> but died very shortly afterwards. It was then her sister, Mary Tudor, a Catholic, who came back to the throne and then started purging England of its uh, rich Protestants. She, fortunately, didn't last too long, and finally Elizabeth came to the throne, who had been regarded as a bastard child, because that whole thing with the, uh, cutting off the Church of England from the Pope, and she came to the throne, established herself, and because she was reigning very much in a man's world, never married. Many, many suitors were brought to Westminster for her to see whether she would possibly like them or not, and she had many favourite courtiers within her own court. The biggest love of her life was Lord Leicester, who you will see at the start of the overture. But for various reasons, she never married. And here we are now, this is a 53-year-old queen towards the end of her reign, and finally this young, debonair, dashing man, the Errol Flynn of his time, arrives in the court, much to the annoyance of the other courtiers who've been serving the queen, looking after her interests. You only have to think of, you'll see Robert Cecil in this production, but his father had served the queen all his life, trying to keep her on the straight and narrow. And they are furious, because this young boy arrives who has no money. So initially she sends him off on uh, help getting the Spanish out of Cadiz. He goes down, he gets a great deal of money for himself and for the queen, comes back with very successes. If you're not only am I very, very fond of you, I'm a great warrior. And she says, right, now I'm going to sort out Ireland. The Catholics uh, and Protestants are at each other's throats in Ireland. And he arrives in Dublin, and the very first thing he does, which she has told him not to do, he, enable, he ennobles all his friends and makes them knights. So she's livid, first thing. Second thing, he goes to the leader of the Irish Catholics and does a deal, says, listen, life's too short, let's not fight. Let's just have an easy time. And then races back to London, saying, Your Majesty, I've done everything you want. And she, he crashes through the court and arrives, and he... He arrives and she's at her deshabille. Here is the aged woman with no wig on, no makeup on, and ladies, the makeup she used at the time to hide her pockmarked face was, that, was actually lead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What it must have been like for the skin must have been anyway, There is this disheveled old woman. He arrives in and she thinks there's going to be a coup d'etat. Sends him a say, so let me at least get dressed. Meantime, she summoned all the courtiers and they say, hang on, you've come back from Ireland. There's no success. You've ennobled all your friends. And where's the deal? He races off to his own house called Essex House, close to where Fleet Street is now in England. And then thinks, hang on, this is not fair. I've done all I should have done. Gets all his friends together, and they start marching towards Whitehall, going westward, and saying, the Queen's in trouble, come and join us. And this was the coup d'etat. At which point the uh, parliamentary army grab hold of him and imprison him. Crucial thing to remember, while Mary Tudor, Elizabeth's elder sister, was on the throne, she herself, as a Protestant queen, was sent to the tower for eight weeks. And normally, once you got sent to the tower, you never got out. Remember, her mother, Anne Boleyn, herself, was beheaded on Tower Hill. And the young Elizabeth, what was she, 14, 15, was in this rather small cell, condensation running down the walls, three foot thick walls, and looking out on the mound thinking, was she next for the job? So when it comes to the point of treason and her beloved uh, courtier Essex is tried for treason and the death sentence is brought to her, it's with great trepidation she picks up the quill pen and she vacillates. All her life has been a vacillation in ruling. She hasn't taken a lover, she hasn't sided with the Catholics or the Protestants. She's tried to just keep England on course. But 
It hasn't been easy. Remember in um, 1588, the Armada sailed up the channel. Philip was so furious about what had happened to Mary Tudor that he wanted to take power in England. Anyway, fortunately for her, she had Francis Drake on hand to get rid of the Armada and fortuitous weather, and the, the Spanish fleet were, were got rid of. But this time, there is no going back. She has to decide, and Essex must die. And the whole piece, what you're going to see, is about where we are in a relationship with other people. You can, you can ignore the history in a way, but it's, it's an extraordinary historical drama, and there's much more to it. In that, in, within the opera, Essex is in love with Sarah, who's turned into uh, Duchess of Nottingham. While he's been away in Ireland, Sarah's father has died, leaving her an orphan. And the Queen, seeing her favourite, say, listen, there's this most wonderful man in Nottingham. Why don't you marry him? He's very, very rich. He'll make you a wonderful wife. And she says in the libretto, I was forced to marry to this, and I, my, my bed is a, is a bed of, is a tombstone. So she's deeply unhappy. And when, the, when Roberto has arrived back from Ireland, initially the Queen makes a mistake. In front of the court, she says, Roberto. And then remembers she shouldn't have called him that. And then she says, Conte, Count, what are you doing here? Sarah is the love interest in Essex's life. And when the Queen goes to him, Do you not still love me? And rather flippantly, he just turns and look at this dishreveled old woman, just turns back to the woman and says, No. At which point she launches <laughs> out on a huge, great cavaletta and all the, the wonderful words. Or a lamp, or a light goes on in, in, in my heart that you, you are being destructive and, and horrible. In Act 2, when proof of Sarah and Essex's infidelity is brought to her, this beautiful embroidered cloth that Nottingham, the, the husband, has seen his wife beautifully embroid the gold leaf into the cloth, and while she was embroidering, seeing the tears stream down her cheek because she is unhappy. But being indecent, he doesn't. He can't understand why why his wife is so unhappy. And then suddenly, in Sir Walter Raleigh's hands, he sees the scarf thrown onto the to the cabinet table, and he realizes what his wife's been up to. So you have infidelity, and also brilliantly, Stephen Lawrence in this production makes Nottingham wear rather thick glasses, and through his myopic vision, he has been unable to see clearly. Wonderful triangle relationship, you get all the politics of it. And in this production, Stephen Lawless sets it in that you have, as it were, the Globe Theatre. Remember, this has been the time of Shakespeare. In Elizabeth's reign, it was thought that she played the first Italian Midsummer Night's Dream. And most of the time, the chorus was spent on the three levels of the Globe Theatre. And there is this, just this front platform where all the action takes place. Sometimes it is a platform where the Queen stands on, sometimes it's a huge cabinet table where military plans are laid out, and then finally this scarf of Cyrus is put on the table. Intrigue at court level. And what is so poignant about the piece is that uh, Virginia Donizetti died one month before the premium. Donizetti had lost his uh, children, they died at a young age, he lost his wife, and the only catharsis for him was in writing these extraordinary pieces. And what it must have been like for the first cast in 1837 to prepare this stuff, and only word came from the uh, naval censors four days before the premiere that they could finally do it. I can't imagine what it must like for us. We were in musicals waiting for, for the mayor to, uh, Tom Levin to say, OK, yes, you can finally go ahead and perform this piece. It's great, great drama. You can learn as much about the history as you want. You can just take it as just a piece of fantastic Italian opera. But it is part of the bel canto tradition. What does bel canto mean? It means lovely singing. But it's lovely singing underlaying the text and the emotions of the text and the rawness of the emotion and who loves who and who commits adultery and who is betraying other people. That's at the centre of the piece. And that's, for me, what makes it so fascinating. 